Welcome to the third and final video in a series on making a large white oak trestle table. The first video I posted was a full length video of the whole process, then I started the series. Part one was going over the design and milling the lumber. Part two was making the top, and in this video I'll show you how I made the base. To start talking about the base's construction, I need to go back to the actual milling. As many of you know, white oak is one of the woods that's used for boat building, and the reason for that is its cellular structure as a closed grain structure versus something like red oak, where you can stick one end of a board down in some water and blow bubbles through that board into a cup of water, and white oak's just not like that. So that makes it kind of hard to dry, and it also can be tricky to dry in a stable manner. And I needed a 6x6 post for this project, so what I did is had that um, lumber milled into 3x6 inch beams, and then I cut them down and glued them up into that 6x6, so that sped up drying and made it a more stable process. A lot of the steps you're going to see in this video are going to represent uh, other steps that I did in the video. I'm not going to show every single step of making the bases. It would make this video way too long. You just saw me roughing down my lumber with an electric chainsaw. It's a very handy thing to have in a shop and use indoors. It's quiet and uh, just a small lightweight tool and it works great for roughing down your lumber. I started the um, joining process out in the fella's shop that I built the top end using his large jointer and planer just to get things down to their size. And then I finished up the base back in my shop, and here I'm showing how I ripped and cut these larger pieces down to length. I did so using a Diablo ripping blade as it's a pretty heavy cut, and it was a brand new blade so it was extra sharp. I use that to both rip and cross cut these pieces to length. And here you see me cross cutting the halves of the main posts that are going to be used in the trestle using a cross cut sled where I had to cut one side, flip it, and flush up the other, and then turn it around and cut it to its length. These pieces were joined using uh, Festool dominoes. This is a Festool Domino XL700. This is the larger of the two. And I'm going to put links for all these tools and things that I mentioned in this video down in the description below. I used this method several times in this project to join different pieces of wood for the base and it really works really good. The biggest reason is, is simply for alignment. It is also a mechanical uh, piece between the two pieces of wood which adds strength but mainly it's for alignment. In the end all I had to do was just take a card scraper to that joint just a few passes and it was totally flush. It's a very accurate cut and the dominoes are a very tight fit in the little mortises that this tool cut. So it works perfect for this along with uh, many other tasks. The glue that I'm using in this entire build is Tight Bond 3. That is the ultimate and uh, the waterproof version. So they make three different versions. They're the regular red label, blue label, which is premium, and then the green label, which is the waterproof ultimate version. Um, they all work great. Uh, just for this one, I just wanted to, at least for my own peace of mind, use the best glue I can. And you also saw me using little chip brushes. I buy those at Harbor Freight. They're just one inch chip brushes and they work really good for getting into spaces and I don't have to worry about them. Once I wear them out, I throw them away and I can cut the bristles down to make them stiffer, leave them long for different projects. They're just great to have around and you never know what you're going to need them for. Both of the large vertical posts in the base have a fairly large mortise and tenon joint in them. I lay this out just using basic tools, measuring tape, ruler, pencil, and some dividers. And I'm not worried if it is exactly perfectly sized because the tenon will be sized to fit it. As long as it's nice and square, I'm good to go. The um, tool I'm using to cut this mortise is a hollow chisel mortiser. And you can see here I'm just taking tiny nibbling cuts. It's a three quarter inch bit, so it's a lot to cut out of the wood. And it seems slow at first, but it speeds up. Mainly you're trying to get rid of the resistance of the wood around the bit, rubbing on the bit itself, causing a lot of friction. You can see here, that's what happens when it jams up. I included that in the video. That's from just pushing too fast. The chips jam the actual drill bit that's inside of that square hollow chisel. So all I end up doing in that situation is I just kind of open up and then just spin the Jacobs chuck that holds the drill bit and freeze it up. You can see here that I'm moving fairly swiftly. I've gotten a lot of the resistance away. The piece has been flipped uh, to finish off the width of the mortise. And you can see that it just cuts right through that white oak. So that's the advantage of starting out kind of slow, taking it easy, 
Intel, you free up some space to work. The chips have somewhere to go. Just everything goes much more smooth. You could also easily cut this kind of a joint out with a drill press, hand drill, or just all um, hand tools. It's just going to be a lot slower. This tool makes for a very quick way to at least rough them out. And then if you want to, you can refine them by hand afterwards. There's a number of ways to cut tenons and to get them all laid out. I'm going to use a radial arm saw to remove the bulk of the material and finish it off by hand. For a layout, I'm using dividers I find center and then I readjust those dividers to half the thickness of the tenon itself and make marks. And then I align the uh, little cutter on a marking gauge to that and scribe all my lines. This eliminates having to use a measuring tape and figuring out the math. I just keep dividing things in half and uh, making marks. Um, so it simplifies things for me. And I got questions about this marking gauge in the first video. It's called the Wood Saber and a tool company named Jessam makes it. They're, you know, they're, most people know them for their router tables, but they made this marking gauge. It's very nice, very adjustable, and stays in place once you get it locked down. I get a lot of questions about different tools that I have. A lot of times it's regarding my Fest tool. Uh, products, the track saw and the joiner, people just asking, you know, is it really worth it? You know, commenting on just how much things cost mainly. And I think value is relative to the person using them and what they're using them for. For me, a lot of the work that I'm doing is paid work, for example, this table. Um, but even in my sort of hobby side of woodworking where I'm just making personal projects, it's still nice to have tools that keep you moving along. Uh, you know, another one of your biggest resources is your time. It's not all about money. So if I can have a tool that allows me to go in the shop and make something a little faster than if I did it a different way, that makes it more likely that I'll even be able to make it into the shop to do so. And tools like this marking gauge and my Fest tool items and other things that I have sort of fall into that category. And so that was a little offshoot, but I like to kind of mention things like that in videos like this where I'm free to ramble. Here's the result of all the cuts made on the radial arm saw, and this was just to get the bulk of that material out of the way. I could have used a dado stack, but I just used my single blade, bumping it over a little each time. It's pretty quick, and then all that little excess can just be knocked off just with your hand, a chisel, or just a mallet. It's pretty easy. It just pops right off. It's a good way to nibble things away with circular saws and all other types of uh, different types of saws if you need to make a lap joint or something. Um, just to get things cleaned up, I rough it down real quick with a chisel. And again, this is just cut close. I'm going to come in and refine it with the hand plane. This is just to clean it up a little more. I, I come back in later and bring this down to its um, actual final thickness, checking its fit back and forth with the actual mortise. Um, to establish the actual width of the tenon, uh, you have to make the cuts on the top and the bottom. And I did that just with it. It's called a Dazuki. Japanese saw. I think that's the brand. It's a really nice one. Uh, very fine teeth. I mainly use it for cutting um, uh, dovetail joints. And then that second saw is just an inexpensive Japanese style uh, um, just cross cut saw. And that's a pretty good general purpose saw and it's about $10. You don't have to worry about it too much. To get the uh, shoulders established on this joint nice and crisp and clean, um, I didn't cut all the way to them on the radio arm saw. And so I come back in with this Lee Nelson rabbit plane and carefully finish it off. And then you can very, very um, carefully come down to that line and adjust. And it makes for zero tear out on your shoulder. Excluding the braces, each end of the base is made of three main timbers. The vertical post you've already seen me work on. And then a part that supports the tabletop. And then a lower horizontal member that makes up the foot of the base. The joint between these three pieces needs to be perfectly square. So I used my the same little rabbit hand plane I was using earlier to plane the end grain in the vertical post. And then I would just check it with the square as I went. The table saw did a good job of getting it extremely close. And in many cases it would have been square enough. But I did want to true it up just a little bit more with the plane. I also built up the lower horizontal piece out of smaller dimensions of wood to get it to its full thickness. The length of it is a solid piece of wood, but then the two feet that come off either end were added on. These pieces were plain to thickness, ripped to width, cut to length, and then the curves cut on the bandsaw. They were joined to the horizontal piece of the base in the same fashion that the two halves of the vertical post were joined together, with four dominoes for each little foot. For joining pieces like this and tabletops where mainly alignment is the goal, I've been using 8mm dominoes. 
From the sketch you can see that there is a small step before the curved cut on the end of the foot. That step was cut on the table saw first in the crosscut sled and then the curve cut on the bandsaw. For those that are wondering, I'm using a 17 inch bandsaw. This one's made by Grizzly. It's the G0513X2 and the blade that I'm using is a Timberwolf brand blade. It's 3 8 inch by 3 teeth per inch. Both the top and bottom horizontal members of the base were attached to the vertical post using Festool dominoes as well, in this case 14 millimeters. If you were doing a similarly large project like this and you didn't want to use the Festool dominoes, you could go the traditional mortise and tenon route, but in this case I would do either a double or triple tenon coming off each end of that vertical post. Reason being you're just going to get a lot more glue surface, make a lot stronger of a joint, and have less issues with possible expansion and contraction. These mortises were cut in both ends of the vertical post and then the corresponding mortises cut into both horizontal pieces. In traditional joinery where you're going to have multiple tenons in one joint, alignment to get all of the tenons to fit can be kind of tricky. Well, it can be really tricky at times. In the case of the Domino, uh, Festool's Domino, they have a setting. It's either a tight fit for the mortise or a loose fit. And when I say loose fit, it's in its width, not in the actual thickness. The thickness of these tenons is 14 millimeters and the cutter's 14 millimeters. So in that uh, orientation, it's tight. But in its width, there's a little bit of slip and that allows you to kind of make up for little differences and then once the glue once the joint is actually assembled you can tap it around with your mallet and get lined up right where you need to be the next pieces that i worked on were the bracing that ran down the length of the table coming off the stretcher from the center supporting the tabletop and then running out to either end of the table base I started by ripping and cross cutting a short piece of oak to length. This makes up the vertical center support that goes in the center of the stretcher, goes up and tees off into a different piece of wood and supports the tabletop. I cut the same 14 millimeter joinery with the Festool Domino in the bottom of that piece and in the top center of the stretcher. Next I need to make the joint between this piece and the horizontal piece of the table support. I do this just by tracing out the uh, dimension of that horizontal piece onto the vertical piece and cut it out on the bandsaw. And again, I do a lot of my woodworking like this where I'm not doing a lot of measurement. All I did was marked out the center of one piece to center of the other and lined them up and traced it out. The horizontal part of the support is tapered and I cut those tapers with my track saw. It's really nice because you can just draw a line right where you want the taper slap the rail down on it and cut it. Doesn't require any sort of a fancy jig for the table saw or any cleanup that you'd have to do after cutting it on the bandsaw. When it comes to track saws, there's all different ranges from the inexpensive way of making it yourself with some plywood rails to buying more expensive options like the Festool and then middle range uh, prices like the Grizzly, DeWalt, and several other brands. The final two steps before gluing the center support together is cutting a slight angle on the ends of the horizontal piece as well as drilling some holes for mounting the tabletop. Basically all I did for those holes is use the drill press to drill a hole about an inch or so deep into the center support as well as the two ends of the base. There was just one in each end of the center support and two in each end of the ends of the bases, the actual trestles. And I just did that with a Forstner bit, then drilled an elongated hole the rest of the way for expansion and contraction of the top. Clamping this joint together is fairly simple. All it is is applying glue to the mating surfaces and then once it's clamped making sure it's square. Oftentimes when you clamp something together the uh, pieces will shift due to the slipperiness of the glue or either some flex in the clamp. So once it's all clamped up check it for squareness and then tap it into true square. Once the glue is dry I drilled 3 8 inch holes all the way through the pieces and then scraped that area clean with a cabinet scraper. I then hammered these 3 8 inch oak dowels all the way through, leaving them proud on either side. Next up, I need to make the long braces that run from the center to the tops of each end of the base. And a lot of this was just done by eye. There wasn't any fancy way of calculating angles or anything like that. The first angles, which were the uh, top end of the braces, I just sort of roughed out by eye, cut it on the bandsaw, and then brought them into a refined uh, dimension with the hand plane and then just clamped it up there and traced the bottom angle. And then the same steps applied to that lower angle. Cut them on the bandsaw and then bring them into shape with a hand plane. And it's nice because you can kind of go back and forth. If you just cut this on the miter saw or the table saw, 
if you did it wrong, you know, you might end up having to remake the whole piece. Whereas if you're using a hand plane, you can bring it in slowly. All the joinery in a situation like this would normally be very complicated with mortise and tenons and so forth. I use the Festool Domino XL to do floating tenons. Uh, and this is one of the cases where this tool really shined. And again, this is one of the main reasons I bought this tool. I bought it for this table and one other table. And then, of course, I'll benefit from it on everything else. And all of those tenons or the mortises for the tenons were cut just by placing pencil lines where I wanted them. And I had to use an assortment of different size tenons based on where they were going in the structure. There's nothing really all that special about the glue up. It's just applying glue into the mortises and on all of the Festool dominoes. Uh, there does kind of seem like it takes a long time when you glue up something with a lot of dominoes because there's twice as many mortises as normal since it's a floating tenon. You've got a mortise in either piece and then the tenon floats between the two pieces. You have to apply glue to all those mortises. But in the end, you're saving a lot of time cutting the mortises themselves as well as tenons. So it's really faster in the end, even though it can seem kind of tedious and that you got a lot of little dominoes laying around. Dominoes are also kind of uh, pricey, but again, comes down to time. For clamping this whole thing together, I used Harbor Freight band clamps and large Irwin clamps. Once all the glue was dry, I sanded the piece with an orbital sander. No need to show you all that's pretty boring. Just sanded it to 220 grit and then started staining. I'm using a Minwax wood stain. This is the... Jacobean. Uh, it's just a standard color that you can buy at Lowe's, Home Depot, or any other place that sells Minwax stains. And my method is I stain for about 15 minutes, and regardless whether I get the whole thing stained, I stop, go back, and wipe it down, and then once wiped down, continue on. The customer wanted some additional bracing added to it. Uh, it was in the plan from the beginning, and I did not put them in for several reasons um, before staining. And I kind of wanted the customer to go without them. I kind of preferred that design, but they liked them, and that's fine. It's the customer's table, so that's okay. So I went ahead, made those, got them stained. Putting them in afterwards made it easier to stain the piece and also made it easier to assemble. I used very large wood screws, lubricating them with uh, Vaseline to make them go in smooth to avoid breaking the shanks. And you're going to have a lot of people have problems with screws, but screws are like, well, they're metal dowels with spirals on them. I think they're better than dowels. And in this application, you wouldn't want to use dowels anyway. I think it'd be a weak joint. And the mortise and tenon or Festool dominoes would have complicated the assembly. For a finish on the table, I chose a lacquer. This is a pre-catalyzed lacquer from M.L. Campbell's. It's a quality finish and dries very fast. I sprayed it right in the front yard with a Harbor Freight spray gun and a small compressor. As you can see, it was very windy, but I got the job done. And on the base, I just kind of went around it twice, basically sprayed two coats and smoothed it down a little bit with those finishing pads I mentioned in the top video. And here it is all finished up, waiting for the top to be sat on it. These are just still photos showing the different details of the base. Overall, I was very happy with the entire project, and I really hope you all enjoy this. It was a massive undertaking to build this table and make a video at the same time. And here's the marriage of the top of the table and the base. Um, you'll see different people helping me throughout the video. This is my dad. He helped me two or three times throughout the process. Um, and this is the kind of project it really needed that. The total weight of this table uh, the top alone probably weighed over 400 pounds, and the base weighed maybe 300 or so. Uh, it might have weighed more than that. It was crazy how much it weighed. It was very difficult to deal with it. I had to deliver it in several trips to the customer's house. So here's how the table started and what it turned into. And that's me very relieved that it was all over. Well, thank you all again for watching the original video and this series detailing the all the steps in getting this project made. Again, it was a very involved project, and I really appreciate all of y'all's sort of input and support on how I put these videos together, and I'm looking forward to more involved projects like this in the future where I produce videos as well. If you have any ideas for videos you'd like to see in the future or any other comments related to this video or any other video that I've done, please leave them in the comments below. If you have any questions, be sure to post them down there as well, and I'll do my best to answer them. You can visit my website, thehomesteadcraftsman.com, for various articles and other things, such as some of the items I sell. I've got an ebook about making money woodworking, 
the t-shirts you see me wearing with the hand plane on the front and furniture plans for farm tables and trestle tables and all kinds of stuff. Like I said earlier in the video, I'll also be posting links down in the description for different products and tools that I use throughout this project, as well as videos that would relate to this project and may help you in other woodworking projects. And if you enjoyed this video and you're not already a subscriber to my channel, go ahead and do so and you'll get updates when I post future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.